Believe it or not, great minds have been thinking about artificial intelligence long before Hanna-Barbera brought us the beloved Rosie, the Jetsons' domestic wonder bot. For tens of thousands of years, humans and our ancestors have been trying to figure out how to make the world work for us. Twigs for fire, wheels for transportation. We got there, some discoveries just took a little longer than others. Modern innovations have come in fits and starts, four big leaps to be exact. UBS lays them out in this paper. 1784, the first industrial revolution with mechanical production, leading to steam-based energy, powering hulking machines like locomotives. Skip ahead almost 100 years, 1870, the second revolution, with mass production in factories and harnessing electrical energy, lighting homes and businesses at all hours. During World War II, engineer Alan Turing created a powerful German code-breaking computer and developed the Turing test in 1950. Wired Magazine describes that test as a benchmark to determine a machine's ability to think like a human. Though his ideas were ridiculed at the time, they set the wheels in motion, and the term artificial intelligence entered popular awareness in the mid-1950s. What began in Turing's lab, though, became part of the third revolution in 1969, computing power. Computers have since become interwoven into just about every part of our lives. Dishwashers, BBRs, cash registers, cell phones. We are now living in the middle of the fourth revolution, AI. Check out this rapid fire timeline published by Oxford and Yale professors, looking at when experts in the field predict AI will outperform humans in certain tasks. Translating languages, 2024. Writing high school essays, 2026. Driving a truck, 2027, which accounts for almost 2 million jobs, by the way. Working in retail, 2031, that's nearly 5 million jobs. And writing a best-selling book, 2049. Economists foresee convulsions ahead as industries reorient themselves to the age of AI. Some developments will be painful, inevitably introducing automation and job loss, but possibly creating new fields as a byproduct. Other developments will make life so much easier, like having Rosie flip the pancakes and maybe a smart car to get Judy and Elroy to school on time. A California judge sided with a local bakery in a dispute over a cake for a same-sex wedding. Kern County Superior Court Judge David Lamp ruled Monday, February 5th, Kathy Miller can refuse to make wedding cakes for same-sex couples because a cake is a form of artistic expression and expressive conduct. The argument started last year when Miller said her Christian faith prevented her from making a cake for Mieja and Aline Rodriguez del Rio. The couple filed a complaint with the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, saying Miller was violating the Unruh Civil Rights Act. Lamp said if Miller had refused to sell the couple a cake that was already baked, it would have been a discriminatory act. The ruling relied heavily on the First Amendment to the Constitution, which protects freedom of speech and religion. The full case will head to trial in June. For United News International, I'm Cambry Caldwell. There were large protests on the streets of Jakarta one year ago, held by conservative groups accusing the city's Christian governor of blasphemy. Basuki Chahaya Purnama was sentenced to two years in prison and lost his re-election bid. During a news conference in Jakarta, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights said this case shows strains of intolerance have made inroads into Indonesia's once liberal culture. If Muslim societies expect others to fight against Islamophobia, we should be prepared to end discrimination at home too. Islamophobia is wrong. Discrimination on the basis of religious beliefs and color is wrong. Discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or any other status is wrong. The High Commissioner has urged Indonesians to not move backwards on human rights and resist attempts to introduce new forms of discriminatory laws. Parliament is discussing a new proposal that outlaws gay relationships or any other forms of consensual sex between unmarried couples. He condemned the raid in Aceh in late January, where a police chief detained 12 people he suspected of being transgender women. He was filmed scolding them in front of an angry crowd 
having them stripped of their shirts and having their hairs cut. While the police chief is under investigation for possible abuses, anti-gay protesters in Aceh came out in his defense. Aceh is Indonesia's only province that enforces Islamic law. We are more and more eroding our own constitution. Our constitution guarantees that all citizens from whatever religion, ethnic group or any other difference are entitled to the same treatment. If one group in society becomes a victim, it means we have failed as a nation. The High Commissioner was invited by the government to witness the progress the country has made in protecting people's rights. But human rights groups say there has been no improvement and Indonesia's human rights situation remains critical. It is seen as a bold move by Indonesia to invite the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights at a time when intolerance against minorities is growing. President Joko Widodo has campaigned on a platform for diversity, has been criticized for not speaking up in defense of all citizens of the country. Heading into elections next year, many here fear that hostilities against minorities will only increase. The government says the High Commissioner praised Indonesia for coming a long way in a short time and for being an example to other countries in the region. But it admits more needs to be done. Step Fasen, Al Jazeera, Jakarta. The flood situation in Sarawak has worsened, with the numbers of victims on the rise on Thursday. The Sarawak Fire and Rescue Department said 5,562 people from 1,682 families have been evacuated from longhouses, villages and boarding schools statewide, compared to 4,600 on Wednesday. There are 31 relief shelters in operation, and the worst hit areas are Samarahan, Bintulu, Limbang and Baram. In Baram, which is located in interior northern Sarawak, rescue personnel evacuated pupils from several boarding schools. 55 schools have been shut due to the floods. The search is continuing for survivors trapped in several collapsed buildings in Taiwan after Tuesday's earthquake. At least four people are confirmed are dead and 145 are missing after the magnitude 6.4 quake struck the coastal city of Hualien. Numerous aftershocks have been hampering rescue efforts. Hualien is home to about 100,000 people and streets were buckled by the force of the quake. The residents have been told to stay away from their damaged homes 
and about 800 have taken shelter in community buildings. About 40,000 homes are without water and highways and bridges have been closed. The flu season is getting worse and health officials are warning watch out. The flu is prevalent in every single state of the continental United States. The Centers for Disease Control says well over 14,000 people have been hospitalized with the bug since the season began. That's double last year's number and the highest recorded since the government started tracking it in 2010. The types of symptoms we're seeing for the flu would be a dry cough, uh, muscle aches, fevers, chills, sometimes a headache, sore throat, um, usually a quick onset of these symptoms. At least 53 children have died from the flu, including 16 last week. Seven-year-old Savannah Jesse of Indiana tested positive for the flu. She died just one day after being rushed to the hospital. Everybody is devastated. It's, you never expect it to happen to you. To stop the spread, some schools are shutting down for days at a time. This Catholic school in Illinois closed its doors after more than a quarter of its students got sick. In Alabama, the Marshall County School District closed after students and staff became ill. It's an airborne problem uh, when they're coughing, uh, sneezing, or even talking. It's when they're spreading this. One piece of good news, this season's flu shot targets the very strains that are making everyone sick. It's why authorities are still pushing the vaccine, even though it's no guarantee. You reduce your chance of getting the flu by about a third. So that's, you know, not zero. What is a zero percent protection is not getting a vaccine. Doctors also recommend avoiding people with the flu because they can breathe the virus out in particles that hover in the air. They suggest washing your hands frequently since the virus can live on hard surfaces up to a day. Also strengthening your immune system with probiotics, sleep and stress management. Most flu seasons last up to 20 weeks. Authorities say this season could still have several more to go. Heather Sell, CBN News. This is what's left of 261 homes in Jura Farm, a remote village in Indian-administered Kashmir. It's less than 300 metres from the so-called line of control, the unofficial border separating regions of Kashmir run by India and Pakistan. People here say the Pakistani army shouldn't target civilian areas. A lot of damage has been done. We are left with nothing. No cattle, no food or clothes. Everything is gone. We just want peace. More than 100 people have fled the violence. They're now living in this makeshift camp where resources are scarce. Our entire village has been destroyed and it's been a fortnight now since we migrated. We are facing immense difficulties. We are short of food. Others are dealing with grief as well as hunger. The shelling started at 6.30 in the morning. Two shells landed inside our house. My wife was killed and me and my son were injured. The fire hit us inside our home. Kashmir has been divided between India and Pakistan since 1947 and remains a hotly disputed territory. Analysts say incidents of cross-border firing along the line of control are increasing and there are several reasons for this. You have elections coming up in Pakistan, you have elections in India next year. No, none of the two sides should want to be seen as, um, um, you know, giving in to the demands of the other side. So uh, it's a lack of political will, I would say, uh, that is really leading to the rise in violations and killing. The shelling has led to the closure of at least 84 schools, impacting a new generation that's only ever known hostilities. Hostilities that threaten the fragile ceasefire implemented 15 years ago. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera. The intensity of the fighting on the ground in Yemen is showing no signs of letting up, while the Saudi-led coalition targets Houthi rebels, infighting between Yemen's political factions has turned city streets into front lines. After more than three years of war, the United Nations says the humanitarian crisis here is the worst in the world, and its children 
who are suffering the most. At this hospital in western Al Dahle province, babies and their mothers are brought here for treatment. Most suffer from severe malnutrition. But with little money and even fewer resources, health officials say there isn't much they can do. Most of our patients are suffering from malnourishment, especially babies who breastfeed from their mothers. The number of children that are dying is higher than that of mothers, as we are unable to treat severe cases. We are also unable to provide proper nutrition to pregnant women. The United Nations Children's Charity says at least 5,000 children have been killed or injured since the start of the war. That means on average five children lose their lives or are maimed every day. The UN says more than 11 million children, nearly every child in Yemen, need some form of humanitarian assistance to survive. The ongoing war has led to the spread of war-related epidemics such as cholera, which broke out in Yemen last year. This exacerbated the malnutrition crisis and caused the number of cases to double. However, we'll never know how bad the situation is because many people cannot make it to hospitals or medical centers. Saudi Arabia says it has sent nearly a billion dollars worth of aid to Yemen and plans to spend another one and a half billion. But rights groups accuse the Saudi military's air campaign of repeatedly striking civilian targets, including markets and medical facilities, and say the coalition's blockade on ports under Houthi control has been a major factor in pushing Yemen into near starvation. Whatever the case, the war and the humanitarian crisis it's caused is likely to continue for some time. In Thiaz Tayyab, Al Jazeera. In China, eight people have died and three more are missing after a major road collapse on a subway construction site in Guangdong province. Nine workers were rescued from the rubble. It's unclear what caused the accident in Foshan. Syrian government airstrikes on rebel-held eastern Ghouta have killed at least 31 people, including 12 children. That's according to a UK-based monitoring group. The bombing also injured around 60 others. The Syrian government's repeatedly said it only targets militants. For three days running, the besieged area east of the Syrian capital has been bombed by warplanes, causing buildings to collapse on residents. The United Nations has described the situation in Ghouta as extreme. It follows a call by its Humanitarian Affairs Office for a month-long ceasefire throughout Syria for aid deliveries. With a Syrian government offensive against rebel-held Idlib and Turkish-led fighting in the Kurdish enclave of Afrin, the UN is warning of people in danger on multiple fronts. Overnight on February the 7th, the Israeli Air Force fired three missiles at a target in the Damascus countryside. The strike was allegedly aimed at a technology research center in the Jemraya area. According to pro-government sources, the Syrian Air Defense Forces shot down at least one missile. Following the incident, the Syrian media accused Tel Aviv of supporting terrorists in Syria with these strikes and said that the attack is linked to the collapse of ISIS and Hayat Tahrir al-Sham HTS, in eastern Idlib and northeastern Hama. The Israeli media argued that the attack is aimed at defending Israeli national interests. Russia has reportedly deployed additional special forces units at front lines in Syria following the Su-25 shootdown in the province of Idlib. According to reports, Russia's Special Operations Forces are now actively operating in the provinces of Hama, Aleppo and Idlib. A notable number of Russian military advisers has recently been spotted in the area of the Abu al Duhur airbase. Some pro-government sources link the growing military activity with the upcoming advance on the Idlib provincial capital. Meanwhile, the Syrian Arab Army SAA and the Tiger Forces liberated 19 villages from ISIS in the northeastern Hama pocket, including Huma, Masluha, Azizia, Luwebida, Jub Uthman, Marami, Jadwaiya Kibya, Jadwaiya Shamalia, Abu Hilal, and Tiwa Dabahin. According to pro government sources, ISIS lost some 12 fighters in these clashes. However, these claims were not yet confirmed by any evidence. Clashes between the SAA and Hayat Tahrir al-Sham also continued in the areas of Musharifah and Tal-Sultan. 
On February the 6th, the FSA accused the People's Protection Units, YPG, of using chemical weapons in the Bulbul district in the Syrian area of Afrin. The YPG allegedly used a shell containing chlorine gas, injuring about 20 FSA members, seven of whom were in a critical condition last night. Most likely, this statement is another example of the ongoing propaganda war in Syria. The so-called moderate opposition often accuse their enemies of chemical attacks. So, the Turkish leadership can use these reports to expand their military efforts against the YPG. Washington uses the same approach against the Damascus government. Mainstream media just blames the Syrian-Iranian-Russian alliance for virtually all civilian casualties in this war. Separately, the Turkish Armed Forces and the FSA engaged the YPG in the village of Shaykh Hubus and the nearby hill. Turkish forces entered the area but were not able to secure it. The YPG also seized a Turkish ACV-15 armored vehicle there. Fighting is ongoing. The U.S.-led coalition says it has carried out air raids against government forces in Syria. The coalition says the strikes were in response to what it calls an unprovoked attack against the headquarters of the Syrian Democratic Forces. The U.S.-led coalition has been conducting airstrikes in Syria since September 2014. Many civilians have been killed in the attacks that purportedly hit the positions of Daesh terrorists in the war-torn country. Damascus has time and again called on the U.N. to help stop U.S attacks. Well, the former Afghan President Hamid Karzai accuses the U.S. and Pakistan of using the war on his country for their own benefits. But the Afghan people want the U.S. presence to be beneficial to Afghanistan, not harmful to Afghanistan. Right now, the U.S. presence to Afghanistan is harmful. The way they are conducting themselves, this presence is hurting us, not helping us. That has to change. Karzai said Afghanistan remained in a terrible shape 16 years after the U.S. led invasion of the country. Further stated that Washington seeks to establish permanent bases in Afghanistan to better control the region, while Pakistan wants to turn Afghanistan into a client state. Karzai also called on Washington to impose sanctions on Pakistan's military and intelligence officials. Echoing complaints from Afghanistan's current government, Karzai accused neighboring Pakistan of harboring Taliban militants. Pakistan has denied the allegations blaming the Afghan government for failing to secure the country. Iraqi forces are in final stages of preparation for an all-out operation in northern governorate of Kirkuk and its outskirts to root out the remaining Daesh terrorists known as white flag bears and prevent them from planning terror attacks. Federal police forces, emergency response units, popular mobilization units Hashid Shabi and Kurdish Peshmerga are taking part in the operation. There are security breaches happening every day by gunmen who are attacking civilians and raiding their homes. To resolve this issue, we need to dispatch government forces to preserve security in the governorate of Kirkuk. Turkmen lawmakers whose constituencies have been worst hit by these terror attacks stress they are the ones bearing the brunt of the current crisis. The Turkmen in Kirkuk are not armed. We have no protection. If the Iraqi government forces do not step in, our people will be forced to pick up arms to protect themselves, and this will have consequences. The so-called white flag bearers have claimed responsibility for recent kidnappings, raids and even terror attacks recorded in Kirkuk and its outskirts. Officials say the operation will be focused around the predominantly Turkmen district of Tuzkhurmatu, west of Kirkuk, as well as an area in its east. Are there any dormant cells? It seems our forces are following up. It seems there are pockets of terrorism which are still trying to cause security breaches. From our talks with security commanders, we know there are newer strategies and intense intelligence efforts in this regard. Meanwhile, in the western province of Ambar, the army's operation to boost security along borders with Saudi Arabia and Jordan entered its third day on Monday. Iraqi forces are currently waiting for zero hour to kick off the key offensive to clear Kirkuk and nearby districts from the Shemenins and prevent them from regrouping. The operations in Iraq's north go in line with similar operations taking place in Iraq's western province of Ambar, which aim at boosting Iraq's security along its borders. Altaf Ahmed, Press TV, Baghdad. Russian cyber experts have managed to hack into U.S. drone technology. 
The hackers trick contract workers into handing over their emails, although it's not yet known what's been stolen. A drone expert says the move is the latest step in Russian data invasion. The hacking is not that surprising. Drone technology is a very desired technology, and Russia has made a big effort to acquire this technology uh, over the past couple of years. And these are multi-role drones that can carry out both surveillance and reconnaissance and even carry out strikes. Meanwhile, the U.S. Department of Defense says any breach leaves troops on the ground vulnerable. The U.S. is looking at whether Russian contractors might have been involved in a Wednesday attack on U.S. fighters and their partners, according to CNN. That could complicate not only the U.S.-Russia relationship, but also American involvement in Syria. Officials with U.S. Operation Inherent Resolve said they hit pro-regime forces in response to what they called an unprovoked attack from President Bashar al-Assad's backers. That's the attack Russia might have had a hand in. Assad regime forces hit the headquarters of the Syrian Democratic Forces. U.S. troops were there at the time, but none of them were hurt. So the U.S. forces hit back. It's one of a few recent examples of U.S. fighters engaging directly against Assad's soldiers. Inherent Resolve is in Syria and Iraq with an explicit objective to defeat ISIS, not fight Assad's forces. But that's been a challenging line for the U.S. to walk as human rights violations stack up against Assad and as his regime's forces threaten U.S. troops and their allies. In June last year, a U.S. Navy jet shot down a Syrian plane after it attacked U.S.-backed fighters on the ground. And coalition planes have hit regime forces posing a threat to a base in Syria that hosts U.S. and coalition advisors. To be clear, it's not certain Russia was involved in the attack that prompted Wednesday's strike. But if it was, it could confound an already clamorous dynamic between the U.S. and Russia, especially when it comes to Syria. Just this week, the two countries clashed at the U.N. over Syria's use of chemical weapons. Officials haven't ruled out Iranian involvement in the initial attack. Now, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Defense says the purpose of Washington's plan to deploy new low-yield nuclear weapons is to force Russia to respect agreements on limiting nukes. James Mattis says Moscow is violating the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, adding that Washington wants to have a bargaining chip to pressure Russia into compliance. He made the statements at a hearing in the U.S. Congress over the past several months. Washington has accused Russia of developing a new cruise missile that violates the 1988 treaty. Moscow has rejected the allegations. Last week, the Pentagon released an updated nuclear strategy review. The document lays out plans to revamp the diversity of the U.S. nuclear arsenal to counter what Washington calls threats from North Korea, Iran, China, and particularly Russia. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has promised to increase pressure on North Korea to force it to abandon its nuclear and missile programs. We will continue to intensify our maximum pressure campaign until North Korea takes concrete steps toward complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization. To that end, I'm announcing today that the United States of America will soon unveil the toughest and most aggressive round of economic sanctions on North Korea ever. And we will continue to isolate North Korea until it abandons its nuclear and ballistic missile program once and for all. Pence was speaking at a joint press conference with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in Tokyo. The comments by the U.S. Vice President come despite a recent thaw in ties between South and North Korea in the wake of the Winter Olympic Games. The North is sending a team to take part in the Games hosted by the South, and the move is seen as a kickstart for reducing tensions on the Korean Peninsula. The tensions have remained high in the past months amid Pyongyang's nuclear and missile programs, which it says it wants for self-defense. Given North Korea's current and emerging capabilities and its extremely provocative rhetoric and actions, it has come to pose an urgent and unpredictable threat to the United States allies, and partners. Consequently, the NPR reaffirms that North Korea's illicit nuclear program must be completely, verifiably, and irreversibly eliminated. The United Nations should not keep blind eye to the U.S. dangerous game of aggravating situation 
and driving the whole world into the possible disaster of nuclear war. You got it. With just a few lessons, Lily is carving the slopes on her snowboard. The most challenging part of snowboarding was stopping. Yeah. That's like the most important part. I know. For this 10-year-old, the excitement of hitting the snow for the first time is a much-needed distraction, as she's trained by Paralympian Keith Gable at the Hartford Ski Spectacular in Colorado. My favorite part about snowboarding is getting to share my passion with people like this young lady right here. Lily was born with a severe joint disorder and voluntarily had her legs amputated. Earlier this year, Lily suffered another loss. Her family's home burned down in the California wildfires. All that was left was rubble. The most important thing she needs, her prosthetic legs and wheelchair were destroyed. It was hard for the first day that I knew everything in my house was gone, but I'm glad I'm here. There you go, twist your shoulders. Getting to snowboard is certainly a highlight for the twin, and even as she learns, she teaches. Her story is so powerful, it's so empowering. Lily has inspired me in so many ways, and, and I do feel like I can relate to her a little bit. And it won't be long before she's catching some major air. Way to go, Lily.